There are over 260 lifeboats stationed around the coast of the United Kingdom and Ireland. On an average day, 12 will be launched to the aid of someone on the sea in trouble. The crewmen are volunteers, continuing a tradition of self-sacrifice which dates back to 1824. The Royal National Lifeboat Institution has saved 120,000 lives and given help to tens of thousands more. For the modest crewmen who undertake this dangerous work, the satisfaction of a good job well done is its own reward. A very good job well done. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Thank you. The RNLI is a charity supported totally by donations and volunteer fundraising. Flag days, fates, everything from museums to coffee mornings help the nationwide effort. The bounding energies of RNLI supporters are as strong inland as by the coast. Wherever people gather together in large numbers, branches and guilds set up stalls which offer a range of RNLI merchandise. A marked up memento of the institution's achievements make an ideal gift or souvenir of a day out. That one is three pounds, Bill. You can have a look at it. It's our latest lifeboat. The latest addition to the fleet, the Lady Elizabeth Brownlee. <laughs> Try that for size, Gemma. Just step back a minute so I can have a look at it. Just go back a little bit. Public support like this all adds up to turn the dream of a lifeboat oh, into reality. <laughs> all proceeds to the RNLI. How would you like a new Volvo, sir? 25 pence could win you a new Volvo. All the proceeds for the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Commercial interests sometimes join forces with the RNLI to help raise funds and provide an altruistic interest for the employees and customers. The Together We Care campaign of Volvo concessionaires provided several motor cars as the top prizes in a countrywide raffle. The Royal National Lifeboat Institution. And if you don't win, consider your support in the lifeboat service. Those pennies and pounds have added up to buy this, a new Mersey-class lifeboat, capable of reaching a casualty at over 20 miles per hour. A triumph for sales director Charles Hunter Pease. Our motive for getting involved with the RNLI was to try to put something back into the community from which we derive our living, but also to join forces with an organisation which was professional and try and provide them with some of the expertise that we have in marketing and sales and that might help them raise funds. But are there commercial advantages? Oh undoubtedly I think being associated with uh, an organization like the RNLI there is a commercial benefit but I wouldn't like to say that was the main reason that we would join forces with the RNLI. A half million pound campaign is crowned by the service of dedication. This is the second lifeboat funded by the raffle of Volvo cars. It is named by the sales director's wife. To invite her to name this new lifeboat, Mrs. Susan Hunterpiece. My lord, ladies and gentlemen, I have very great pleasure in naming this lifeboat Lifetime Care. May God bless her and all who sail in her. The RNLI is constantly working to improve rescue services. The Mersey Carriage Launch Lifeboat is the latest result. At Bridlington, the boat has to be drawn through public roads for the short distance between the lifeboat shed and the beach. A lifeboat must be able to be launched at any state of the tide and in all weather conditions. It must be based close to areas of the coast where natural hazards of the sea occur. A situation which, by definition, is often some distance from the nearest conventional haven.
To launch from a beach, the boat needs a shallow draft and protected propellers. And yet, she must be stable and powerful enough to cope with storm force conditions. A sharp contrast to the type of boat with which the RNLI started its service in Victorian times. As Britain's sea trade grew in the 19th century, shipwreck and maritime disasters became a daily occurrence. Tens of thousands of sailors, fishermen and maritime passengers lost their lives. This boat was once stationed at Aberystwyth. It was saved from being burnt and lovingly restored by a group of museum enthusiasts. An unusual chance to reenact the difficulties of rowing and sailing which must have confronted the lifeboatmen a hundred years ago. Very, very difficult. It amazes any, all of us how they, how they used to do it. Do you think they must have been tough men in those days? Well, they were tough, obviously, and, and used to row in boats. I mean, they didn't have engines in those days, and so this is the way they worked. Many of the graves in Whitby Abbey Churchyard are monuments to lost sailors. But in this appropriate setting, a lifeboat from the 1930s is used for fundraising by giving people a nostalgic opportunity to experience a lifeboat over 50 years old. The introduction of the diesel engine, which could be brought into life instantly, revolutionized rescue. The early 1990s sees the final phasing out of lifeboats of the traditional shape. But a major investment program can now provide a safer, faster service to the seafarer. The Tyne-class lifeboat has been developed for slipway launching. At the pool headquarters of the RNLI, the administration of both service and fundraising are backed up by an experienced technical team. The RNLI continues to develop new classes of lifeboat to cater for the changing pattern of disasters at sea. The research team combines a century's experience with the latest technology. The aim is to turn a theoretical drawing into a practical design able to drive through hurricane-lashed seas. The development and modifications start in the drawing office, where everything from buoyancy to the ever-increasing circuits which keep the latest electronic running is documented. Then ideas are tried out. The lives of crew and survivors depend on successful designs. Performance and safety must be predicted for all states of sea conditions. The RNLI team supervises every stage of development, right up to the ultimate test. Every boat is craned upside down before it is allowed to go into service. On the rare occasions in the past when lifeboat crews have been lost, capsize in high seas has often been a contributing factor. Every new boat is now tested. The dedication of a new lifeboat is a major event in the history of any station. When a new Aran class boat was placed at Thurso in northern Scotland, she was given the name the Queen Mother in honor of one of the many members of the royal family who have helped the RNLI in its work, an association which goes back more than 60 years. 18 years ago, I named the three sisters. And during her time in your care, she was launched in service 97 times and saved 
23 lives. This in itself says much about the Fair Cell lifeboat men. And it is with pleasure and with pride that I name her the Queen Mother. May God bless her and all who say with her. It's a moving moment for the lifeboatmen who serve on her. A time to remember the past services dedicated to saving life. Across the vicious waters of the Pentland Firth is the small Orkney island of Hoy. In 1969, their lifeboat was lost on service and all eight members of the crew perished. It was a particular tragedy in a small, isolated community, but immediately volunteers came forward and offered themselves to form a new crew. The life-saving traditions of the Long Hope Station continue to guard one of the most treacherous pieces of water in the world. crew regularly train with other rescue organizations to provide a cohesive service coordinated by the Coast Guard. The team work closely with air sea rescue helicopters. The skills of life-saving constantly change and the crew train and practice ready to answer the next life-saving call when it happens. Right, if you look at the charts in front of you, you'll see... Electronic technology moves forward even faster than boat design. Crews regularly return to the classroom to be brought up to date about navigational equipment and new operational procedures. ...on that position line, because that's what it is, it's a radio position line. At Ballyglass, on the bleak Atlantic beaten coast of Western Ireland, a new lifeboat station has been set up. The volunteer crew have come to the training center at Poole to be put through their paces. They must be able to tackle every emergency as a matter of routine. A crew member swept over the side during a rescue is a possible scenario in rough seas. One man continuously points at the waterlogged dummy. We've just thrown a dummy over the side to represent um, a man overboard and as the coxswain was coming round to recover it, we've lost the steering, so they're now having to rig emergency steering. In difficult conditions and under stress, problems can compound themselves. These raw volunteers rehearse disaster and build themselves into a team willing to put to sea when every other sailor is seeking shelter. Thank you. 
By chance, this same crew is to find itself called out to a sinking fishing boat in storm force 10 winds only a few weeks after this trading exercise. I find it very good actually. You know, they're, they're very thorough and uh, we're a new crew and uh, they take us through the whole procedure as it should be done. And we hopefully will learn it in that manner. Tiring? Yes, tiring. Since we're beginners, we find it tiring, but we'll stay with it. On the unprotected west coast of Ireland, the station is still under construction. This new lifeboat station symbolizes the RNLI's dedication to the service of saving others at sea. The crew practice readiness for call-out, and the lifeboat station is run from a temporary porter cabin. Start the engines over. Roger, sir. International composer Phil Coulter has written a song dedicated to his brother who was lost at sea to help raise funds and publicize the institution. On a cold winter's night with a storm at its height a lifeboat answered the call They pitched and they tossed till we thought they were lost as we watched from the harbor wall. Though the night was pitch black, there was no turning back, for someone was waiting out there. But each volunteer had to live with his fear as they joined in a silent prayer. Carry us home. The RNLI generates its own publicity in many ways, especially through the regular editions of the quarterly journal. Supporters can read eyewitness accounts and citations of rescue work and find out about fundraising activities. It has a distribution of 150,000 copies. And the lifeboat finally returned to Malaig with two of the survivors. Every year, some of those same supporters come together to honor crew members involved in the most outstanding the rescues. remained standing by until a tug arrived, and finally, in the late afternoon, the tug began to tow the coaster back to Kirkwall. For his determination, his high standard of seamanship, and his courage, Cox and William Sinclair is awarded a bar and bronze medal for the Lifeboats are launched some 4,000 times in an average year. A handful of the volunteer crews find themselves in particularly dangerous situations and are honored with medals. This symbolizes the high standard of dedication and sacrifice expected from all those who serve to save life. Nineteen eighty nine ninety was particularly severe. One incident from the many that happened that year started in late October as the first of many storms swept up the English Channel. A May Day is received from an ocean going cargo ship. The captain has lost engines and anchors are dragging. Please, I have a problem with the main engine also in uh, generators, please, over. Yeah, our quarter, this is Poland, uh, Roger. Uh, we are getting the lifeboat to you as soon as possible. As soon as possible, stand by. At 1.15 on Saturday afternoon, the 30th of October, 
Yarmouth lifeboat sets out from the Isle of Wight to join Swanage crew. By three o'clock, winds reach 93 knots, 105 miles per hour. As Swanage lifeboat is relieved from duty, a crew member has the presence of mind to photograph the Yarmouth Arran almost airborne in some of the worst seas in living memory. By early evening, Swanage lifeboat is rehoused. Yarmouth shelters nearby. Salvage operation is still underway in the channel tonight. The family and friends of the crews watch the drama unfold on television. The vessel is the Maltese registered ship Al Quaver. It's now seven miles off Swanage. The captain put out a mayday after its engines failed. Guy Phillips reports. The stricken cargo ship was still listing. Helicopter shots of the casualty remind everybody of the dangers facing the two lifeboat crews. The drama began at noon on Saturday, seven miles off Swanage. On board the casualty, the situation deteriorates. Uh, Oscar, you get me, you get me. We like to abandon. We cannot stay. We cannot stay over. Early on Sunday morning, the master decides to abandon ship. The Yarmouth lifeboat and the Swanage lifeboat are launching to your assistance. Coxon of Yarmouth lifeboat moves to take off some of the crew. Fortunately, the wind speed has dropped to force 10. In darkness and mountainous seas, six separate attempts are made to grab survivors from a cargo net hung over the stern. The lifeboat has to be driven against the ship's side. The master of the cargo ship fears a capsize at any moment. Cox and David Kennett will receive a bronze medal for gallantry for the rescue this night. The crews receive commendations. Two survivors are safely aboard the lifeboat by the time the helicopter arrives to airlift the remaining six survivors to shore. A good job, well done. The comforting words between the crews as they reach more sheltered water. The lifeboat returns home 18 hours after receiving the call for help. This is just one of the many stories of lives saved by the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. There's an abandoned, unlit coaster. Name Alkwasa. They had been a word in pairs at the foot of all the stairs to wait for the radio call. And just before dawn, when all hope was gone, 
came a hush and a far away sound. Twas the coxswain he roared, all survivors on board, thank God, and we're homeward bound to carry them all. Oh.